Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. Come on, what a great day, isn't it? I love it. I love it. And it's good to see everyone that shows up. I'm going to get a report. Names, we're going to call names at every location and who's here today. Man, and we're going to go to the throne of God and we're going to just believe that there's going to be extra jewels in the crowns of everybody who's at church on a day like this, right? Yes, amen. So I was thinking this week about something that happened to me when I was in fifth grade. It was the very first day of fifth grade. First day, okay? And um, it's just moments before the, the bell rang so that they opened the doors and everybody came in. And you're kind of all standing around. Your friends that you haven't seen all summer and everybody's hanging out together at the footsteps of, to go into the, uh, in, into the school. And, and as we're there... There was a bird that flew over that strategically placed its bomb just perfectly that came flying down. I didn't see it, but I finally felt it as I, it hit me right on the forehead and then just rolled down between my eyes over my nose, perfectly placed in his bird's view purposely. And, 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 and immediately I just, everybody saw it. I felt it. I'm waiting for the doors to get in so I can go wash off. I, I get in, everybody's laughing, everybody. And what had turned into the first day of festive, fun, seeing friends turned into a nightmare for me. So all day, matter of fact, even beyond that day, what happened was two things. Number one is this, that day, I was the talk of fifth grade. Not for good purposes either, but to be made fun of. And to laugh about. And secondly, all day, even though I washed that off, the stench and the smell of that bird poop stayed with me, it seemingly, all day long. I could not escape it. And for me, that was about as bad as it gets for a fifth grader when it comes to suffering. I, I was suffering, folks. Uh, this past week, though, I got back from Jordan and the Syrian border. And I saw suffering in a whole different light. Um, I saw refugees that filled basically the nation of Jordan that is about 9.5 million people. Four million of them are refugees from Syria, from Iraq, from Yemen, from Sudan, from Lebanon that have filled that country. These people cannot work. They struggle to get by. They have very little health care. Uh, it's hard. Matter of fact, every place that I went, uh, no heating, no air. Uh, little bitty stone places that I went into would be just cold, frigid cold. Um, here's a picture of one family that I got to meet, um, refugees from Syria just across the border. And as I sat with them, I saw this family. I didn't recognize until afterwards we looked at the pictures and walked away that we took. There's three of us that are the outsiders, and that is the guy on the far left uh, who is a missionary from Mexico, and then me in the center, and then on the far right was JJ from North Church who traveled with me. Uh, when we got back, we looked. At, we were the only ones smiling. Uh, all the kids, the mom and dad and the grandma who had seen their home obliterated with bombs, who had been ran out of city after city and tracked month after month to try to get out of Syria. Uh, their little boys had guns held to their head and threatened to be killed unless they told what they wanted to have heard from them. Uh, walking barefooted because when they had to flee their home, they had no chance because the home just blew. You, what you didn't see in that picture was a girl who's under the covers who is burned severely and is still recovering from the burns uh, that she has faced as a result. And then I'm thinking, oh, okay, my suffering's not so bad. Oh, my suffering's not, not, not so bad. Here's what I have found out, that suffering is very real. Today, we're going to talk about suffering. We're going to talk about what it means to have victory in suffering. Okay? I want you to write this down. First off is this. Victory in God's kingdom is not measured in wins and losses, but in obedience. Stop and let that sink in for just a moment because King Saul in the Old Testament thought it was about wins and losses. He thought it was about victory on the battlefield. He thought it was about winning the approval of people. And God told King Saul, he said this, he said, finally, he removed from him 
the anointing off his life and moved that to a young man that was coming up named David. And he said, obedience is better than sacrifice. It's about obedience in God's kingdom. Second thing to note is this. Victory in God's kingdom is not measured in peace and prosperity, but in endurance. Let's go forward to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, you find a man named Jesus, okay? Uh, Jesus, who was man, who was God, made this statement. The person that endures to the end shall be saved. He didn't say the person with the most toys at the end or the person with the most happiness and joy at the end, but the person who endures to the end shall be what? Saved. What I also found in my trip from Jordan is that many of the people who had fled, okay, some of them were Christians, not all of them, but a small percentage Christians, but there was many of them that were Christians that fled for their life. Um, even many of these Christians, though, maybe generational Christians, but really don't have, have, a, have a foundation of faith, that, of understanding, you know, the biblical significance of who Jesus Christ is. But many of them would have ISIS come into their towns, and they would ask who were the Christians, and some, some of the neighbors of the Christians would rat them out, and they would go and put a symbol on their door of their house, uh, of, of their whatever it may be, and this would be the symbol that they would put. Uh, that symbol meant basically this, you better get out, okay, because you've got 12 hours, or you've got whatever, and, or, or you're going to be killed, okay? That symbol meant this, that that person living in that house or that family are followers of the Nazarene. That's an Arabic for Nazarene. And it means they're followers of the Nazarene. They're followers of this carpenter's son. They're followers of Jesus. And they had to leave everything behind. I met individuals that left everything and probably will never, ever go back to their home again. Stuff that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Farms, homes, businesses, that are lost forever. We've been going through the book of Habakkuk. We're in chapter number three, and what you just heard at every location was the reading of chapter number three of the book of Habakkuk. I want you to go back and read it again today and look at that whole book. As a matter of fact, you can read chapter one, two, and three, the whole book, in a matter of just about 20 minutes. Sit down and read it because it's all about suffering with really no resolution, or at least a resolution that we would want when it comes to the issues of suffering in our life. And so Habakkuk teaches this, write this down. He teaches us that as children of God, we are not shielded from suffering. There's never this place that you get where you're like, hey, I've risen to this spiritual level that now I do not have to suffer. Matter of fact, oftentimes suffering Okay? We think suffering sometimes is an evidence of the lack of faith, but the truth of the matter is, it may be the presence of your faith. Let that sink in for just a moment. It could mean that God is entrusting you with more than other people can handle. And it could mean also that God is allowing you to go through times of suffering to continue to grow you into what he is ultimately wanting to make you. Right? And so when it comes to suffering, the Bible talks about it a lot, and sometimes we don't like to reflect on it because we'd rather talk about fun, joyful things, right? Yeah, but suffering is very much a part of our life. First off is this, is that suffering happens to everyone. It happens to everyone. It rains on the just and the unjust. It doesn't matter where you are in your life or who you are, where you come from, it happens to everyone. So oftentimes when it happens to us, the devil isolates us and makes us feel like we're the only one going through it. And that is not the case. Just because others aren't talking about it doesn't mean they're not going through it. Just because you can't feel what they feel doesn't mean someone else is not going through suffering too. Secondly is this, is that suffering is multifaceted. What I mean by multifaceted, I mean it comes in a lot of different ways. I've had times in my life where I have suffered physically with great pain. I've had other times where just somebody's word that they said to me hurt me so deeply and I suffered greatly from just how they talked about me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
And so it comes in multiple ways, multiple faces. It, it happens for the teenager that is having disagreements with mom and dad and they feel like, and, and, they're, and they're suffering. It could happen for somebody in high school who feels like they've been rejected by the in group or they want to fit in and they're not fitting in. It could be from college because you didn't get accepted in that college or you got fired from that job. So I'm talking about suffering, folks. It comes in different levels, it comes in different faces, it comes, but it is just as important for you. Your suffering means something to you. It could be cancer that you're battling, it could be death, it could be divorce, it could be, you know, rejection of your children who are just like making decisions that are crazy. It could be financial struggles and bankruptcy, but suffering is real. And suffering is also, get this, Suffering is meant to be shared in community. And I think this is one that we miss out on. And as, as the church, we should, we should be rallying around those who are suffering. And those who are suffering should be sharing those, not expecting everybody to know exactly what I'm dealing with. They should be opening up. The Bible says to bear one another's what? Burdens. Bear one another's sufferings. That we are to rally together. It's, it's not meant to be done in isolation. Isolation breeds deception. It's meant to be shared in community together. And also suffering equips us, get this, equips us to serve others. It prepares you for ministry. Because ultimately that's what you, when you go through something, so many times we go through something and we shut down and won't, don't want to bring others into my past. And that's not what, it, it's wasted suffering if that's the case. You follow me? Do not waste the time of suffering. Uh, allow it to be a platform so that you can use it to bring hope to others. Now, there's time for that. Not every single time, not as soon as you get through a situation, now you've, you're ready to share. But there is a place where what you went through is an opportunity to be able to help somebody else out. And finally this, suffering makes us stronger. Suffering ultimately makes us stronger. Just like when you choose to suffer with what you want to eat and say, I'm not going to eat that, that's called suffering, right? <laughs> I'm, not about. I'm not going to eat that because it's better for your health or you're losing weight or whatever or you're going to limit your portions. That is a measure of suffering to make you what? Better, stronger. When, when you go work out. Nobody like really just enjoys working out. You may get in habits of it. You may enjoy working with somebody else, but it's not like you just enjoy being sore. You enjoy working out. You do it. Why? So that you can get, why do you give yourself at a skill or at your job to be the first one at work and to give the extra time to it? Why? Because you totally enjoy it. Yeah, you could become a workaholic, but for the most part, it's because you want to what? Get stronger, get better, get better. I'm going to give you three disciplines that I learned from the book of Habakkuk, chapter three. Three disciplines, okay? Uh, I'm gonna talk about remembering, I'm gonna talk about rejoicing, and I'm gonna talk about repetition. Because these are disciplines. Maybe you've never saw them as disciplines, but they're disciplines that will help you in times of suffering to make you stronger, okay? First off, let's go this one, remembering. The first discipline is remembering. I had a friend of mine um, o over the years, I, I just watched as, as when they would be reminded of something that happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even 20 years ago that brought pain in their life, they like got so worked up just as, as if it happened yesterday. You ever been around somebody like that? Or maybe you've struggled with that? It's like you start thinking about that person, that situation, how that they didn't, they failed you. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're just as worked up emotionally as you were 20 years ago. It speaks to they've never walked through it. They've never gotten stronger. Actually, it makes you weaker. Which brings me to this question. How do you remember your past pain? How do you remember your past pain? Do you remember it as God's punishment or maybe somebody else's punishment? Or do you remember it as God's provision in your life? There's a big difference here. See, because if, if it's the former punishment, your present suffering will be an unpleasant waste of your pain. Hear me? But if it's the latter, if it's God's provision and how he has done miracles to get you through, if it is the latter, your present suffering will be a pleasant promise that God wastes no pain. And that's the hope we have as followers of Jesus. That when we go through something here on this earth, that God wastes no 
pain, that his promises are true. And when I come out on the other side, I'm gonna be better for it. You know what gets you hope to get through something? Is the promise that God makes no mistakes and that he wastes nothing and that you're going to be better for it. Come on, somebody preach with me. Man, Habakkuk chapter number three. Let's look at it, verse number one. Notice what it says. This prayer was sung, sung by Habakkuk. The opening part of it. Okay, he's went through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It starts off, this prayer was sung by the prophet. Stop there just a moment. Let's talk about prayer. Okay, first off, you got to go to God with it. When it comes to your remembering, how you remember, you got to go to God. And, and it's interesting that prayer sung, prayer sung, do you realize that when we worship around here, that those songs that are being sung, okay, whether they're your flavor or not your flavor, those words that are being put on the screen are prayers. And when we sing, we're praising God, we're singing prayers unto God. So I encourage you to learn how to like it. I, I encourage you to learn how to praise him and learn how to pray. Because it can be refreshing to your soul. I, I've never been into this, getting into the genre. I have to have like this or that. And I realize we're going to have our type of genre. We're going to have our type of song. But I'm telling you, I don't care what it is. I have walked into different types and structures. And I, I believe that there's a place that you can come in your relationship with God that it doesn't matter the style. If those words are uplifting to God and they're pointing to Jesus Christ, you know what? It feeds my soul and builds me up. You know what prayer should be? Prayer should be honest. They should be humble. And they should be done out of hunger. Prayer should be very raw, honest about what's going on inside of you. I'm hurting God. I'm struggling God. Prayer should be humility. Not in like blaming God, accusing God, but in God, you're my only choice, my only hope. And then also be in a hunger that my only hope, where, can else, where else can I turn but you, God? And remember that. Do not forget that. Let's look at the next verse. It says this, verse 2. I have heard... All about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing work. Stop there for just a moment. I heard, I heard, I heard. Faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Word of God. You know what he's doing? He's remembering a past time. He's remembering back when. In this time of our deep need now. So he's remembering the past, how God provided. Help us again. Come on, do what you've done in the past as you did in years gone by, and in your anger, he says, remember your what? You know, when he's telling God to remember, it's really about him remembering what God does in his faithfulness. And when you're reminding God of what he's done, it's really you reminding yourself of what God has done and being reassured that the same God who did yesterday's miracles is the same God who's gonna do miracles for you today. Now, now get this. In verses, the, the next verses, uh, verses 3, 4, 5, all the way down to verse 15. Habakkuk begins to remember the events of how God had did great things for the children of Israel. I'm just going to pull out one. I don't have time to pull out all of them. You've already heard some of them in the reading today. But look at verse number 8. Was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Now, now notice this. He says rivers and parted the sea. So he's, he's incorporating more than one thing. He's incorporating the Red Sea party, remember that? The children of Israel out of Egypt, and God what, does what? Splits the Red Sea, but also the Jordan, okay? The Jordan had been split multiple times also to show God's power. Where were you displeased with them? The answer is what? No. You were sending your chariots of salvation. Here is the point that we've got to go. Just because you go through slavery, just because you face a Red Sea, just because you face the Jordan or the Jericho walled cities, God is not displeased with you because you're going through suffering. God loves you. What is God doing? He's just setting the stage so that he can show up with his chariots of salvation to deliver you and set you free. And why does he do that? To testify to this world. Of who lives in you and who God is. That's why he does what he does. Oh, wow. So, does your remembrance of past pain cause you to grumble or be grateful? Go on, no show of hands right now. Okay, don't bump the person next to you. I want you to let your suffering 
be an invitation to listen, to learn, and to grow. Can you do that? Can you, can you let your suffering be an invitation? Say, I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. Secondly is this. Second discipline is rejoicing. Again, you may have not thought of these as uh, disciplines in your life, but rejoicing is a discipline. Is a discipline. So when I was in um, Jordan, I met a very surprise to me. I met a number of missionaries from around the world because you hear about these revivals going on around the world and you're thinking, okay, what are they doing? We need somebody besides the Americans stepping up and doing missions work. I was pleasantly surprised because I met more missionaries from around the world than I did from America. I met missionaries from Jordan. I met missionaries from Argentina, from Mexico, from Colombia. I met other missionaries too. I mean, the people that said God called them to leave their country to go to the most embattled, roughest part of the world to suffer for Jesus so that other people can hear about the good news of Jesus. I met this one guy from China, okay? If you don't know, God is doing probably one of the greatest revivals in the history of mankind has been happening in China over the last many years. It, it, when they thought, when it was closed down, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, that there was, the church was dead. Actually, the church was just like building steam and growing. Now they say that there's millions, hundreds of millions of Christians in China. I met this one guy, show a picture of him here, who came there on the border of Syria to serve as a missionary. Now his undercover is a restaurant that he started that's a Chinese restaurant, which is appropriate, Right? And so he's cooking Chinese food on the corner, right on the edge of the Syrian border, all right? And so he is giving food to people, okay? Uh, But he also has an underground church that is a growing church of almost 100 people now. Isn't that great? Yeah. This guy was so joyous, so positive, so life-giving. But there was one thing that was a concern for me for him. I don't know if anybody noticed in the picture something that was alarming. (laughs) Go back to the picture again. The guy's wearing OU sweatpants. Anybody notice that? (laughs) OU sweatpants. He's from China. He's never been to the United States. He's wearing OU sweatpants. So I immediately asked him, what are you wearing? And he said, I don't know. He kind of looked down like, I don't know. What am I wearing? And I said, where did you get those pants? And thank God to Jesus he did not even know what he was wearing (laughs) he said all I know he said he said he said he he could speak English had broken English but he could speak English he said I I found these at a thrift shop down the road and he paid one JD which is Jordan money which was about a dollar fifty in American money he said he paid a dollar fifty at a thrift shop I said I feel better about this moment I feel better about that. And I promised him that the next time I come that I would bring him some Holy Spirit filled orange pants that he could wear (laughs) And he really loved that idea. He... What would cause a man to leave his family? Now, he brought family with him, but to leave pretty much his family, leave everything from China, to come to a place that's a God-forsaken part of the world that's struggling other than the joy of the Lord. I think of Jesus when he looked at the cross and he endured its scorn and its pain and he rejoiced and what was going to come of the suffering. Is anybody listening? Is anybody tracking? You see, rejoicing in the Lord is a discipline. It's something you do regardless of how you feel. That's what discipline is. It's something you do regardless of how you feel. What does it mean to rejoice in suffering? Habakkuk, it teaches us that. Come on, you start chapter one, it's about suffering. Chapter two is about suffering. It's about questions to God, wrestling with God. Any answers come? No, you know what he did? He kept embracing the struggle and wrestling, knowing that in the end, he wins. Because God has won. God has won. Look at verse number 17. Oh, this was so good. Even though the fig tree have no blossoms, and even though the grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though 
the flocks die in fields and the cattle barns are empty. Did you stop that? Stop right there for just a moment. Did you get all the even those? That's not meant to be a comprehensive list. You can add a whole lot of things, but all of those things represent something that maybe you are not familiar with if you haven't come from a farming background. As I look out across Oklahoma City, most of you do not look like farmers. You don't look like that you do this for a living. But let me put it in vernacular that all of us would understand in Guthrie and Deer Creek and Oklahoma City and online that even though your bank account plummets to zero, even though your credit cards are rung up, even though you have lost your job, even though your retirement account is gone and has been depleted and lost, even though the stock market falls, even though the doctor has given you a bad report and you've got cancer, even though it seems like others are departing and leaving in your life and dying left and right, even though you face all of that, look at verse number 18. Yet I will rejoice in what? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Say it with me. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's a discipline. That's not based on feelings. It's based on faith. It's learning to trust God in spite. I I, I got this picture I'm going to share with you of Marcus Watson and his wife, Michelle, and their amazing family. This was just a few weeks ago, and Shannon and I were praying with their family and their kids and their Several of the family members, they're just out of the picture. We didn't know if Marcus was going to make it. Didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But you know what I so appreciate? When I see people that I get to pastor, and Marcus and Michelle and Guthrie, love you guys. I get to see people like this that I pastor that are going through suffering. That is life and death issues. But yet they still look upward. And they remember God's faithfulness. And they rejoice anyway. That's what being a follower of Christ is all about. Is anybody listening? I got got good news for you. We didn't know what the outcome was going to be there, but they praised God anyway. Well, it was weeks in the hospital. But this past week, Marcus and and Michelle were both at the North School of Ministry sitting there And he is still graining strength, but he is well, he's healed, and God is on his throne. But let me just say, even if it doesn't turn out the way we want, God is on his throne. That's what rejoicing is all about. Third thing is this. Our third discipline is repetition. Everyone, I hope, understands the power of repetition. You've most likely lose, used the power of repetition to memorize, you know, material for tests back in, you know, U.S. history or world history. You know what I'm talking about? You've memorized things, repetition, repetition. You understand some of you have gotten excellent in your job because of repetition. You're working at your game. In sports, we understand the power of repetition, shooting that shot over and over and going through the motions again and again, the power of repetition. Somebody being dyslexic, I understand I had to work on repetition, memorizing it over and over again. Repetition. So after you remember, after you rejoice, what do you do? You repeat the process. When you're in times of suffering, you repeat the process. Remembering. God's faithfulness, rejoicing in the middle of your circumstances, and let God. Throughout the Bible, the Bible repeats itself again and again. The Gospels, the four Gospels, you know what those are about? They're repeated stories, (laughs) aren't they? It's like, why don't I say it again? It's from a different viewpoint. It's like everybody, we go out there, everybody sees an accident happen. Okay, you ask the five people that saw it, all of them are going to see from a different vantage point. What you have with the Gospels is all different vantage points, but it's pretty much the same story being repeated again and again. Why did God have to do that? Okay, why, why does he say over and over again things like this? Look, look, at verse number, look at verse number 18. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And he says it again, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. There's something powerful about repetition. So, so it is important for you to not just get the word of God when you hear me speak. It's important that you get the word of God in you at your home, at your work, listening, going down the road. It's very important. And then you repeat that when you go to a north group, okay, and you talk about it. And then you repeat that again when you come to listen to me on 
Sunday or on Thursday and you are repeating what you've already learned. And you know what I do every week? I pretty much say the basic same things every single week. I mean, it may be a different passage I'm reading from. It may be a different way that I'm saying it, but it's all the same stuff. It's all pointing back to Jesus and to his word. And we're going to repeat this thing again and again. Why do you need to come worship? Even on snowy listening at home online, I'm thank you they're joining me. But you know what? Uh, Don't let that be an excuse. Why do you show up? Because you need to repeat this process again and again of remembering what Jesus did for you and rejoicing in his name and understanding that some way, somehow, I'm going to get through this time of suffering. Ooh. The 10,000 hour principle, I don't know if it's true or not exactly, that, was that number, but repetition works. Philippians 4 and verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord Always, I I like how Paul does this. I will say it again, rejoice. Think about that for just a moment. He's in prison, he's struggling, and he says, I'll rejoice in the Lord always. I'm gonna say it to myself again. I'm gonna rejoice. Sometimes you gotta talk to yourself. So you, you let the devil talk to you. you. You've let other people talk to you. And there's a lot of voices stirring in your mind. You need a choice to align yourself to God's word and you speak to yourself what God's word says. I will rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. I will what? Rejoice in the Lord. Wow. Yay, Jesus. Which brings me to the last thought. I want you to write down. This is not a discipline. It's not a discipline. I gave you three disciplines. And I'm going to give you the result the result of this effort. Chapters one, or chapter one, there's not multiple chapters one, ended with just questions. Sometimes in your life, all you're gonna have is the question mark, right? You just got a question mark. Chapter two ended with this thought. The last words were just like, but the Lord. But the Lord what? He's in his temple, he's on his throne, he hasn't changed his position, That reminds us where he's at. But in chapter number three, he ends differently. Look at verse number 19. These are the last words he says. The sovereign Lord is my what? He makes me sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. Did you get that? Let's look at it one more time. The sovereign Lord is my what? Now, did did he get the victory? Did he? Yes. No, no. Most people say, no, he didn't. The Babylonians are still going to come in and destroy everything. No, no. But in him, victory did happen. Because he learned that victory in God's kingdom is not about wins and losses, but about obedience, right? He learned that in victory in God's kingdom is not about peace and prosperity, but it's about what? Endurance, endurance, obedience and endurance. And so the result is the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me, what? Sure-footed as a deer, able to tread up on heights. Do you see what he's doing here? He's saying, no matter what comes my way, I'm sure-footed. I am stable, I am solid, I'm growing stronger, and I'm moving upwards. That's the good news we have in Jesus, folks. (laughs) That's the hope we have. I met a lady over in Syria, named Mama Mary. Mama Mary had been, ran out of her country in Africa. This is a picture of her. Ran out of her country in Africa. She witnessed a murder that she testified against. Several family members were killed in her family and she had to leave the country and fled. She's been gone for years. She went as a domestic worker in, in Jordan. Found out as she was a domestic worker that many other African women were being human trafficked. Most of them were not for, there's probably some for sexual purposes, but more of it was for uh, slave labor. As they were being wrongly imprisoned in homes, papers taken from them, working 16, 20 hours a day with not even any extra pay, having to serve multiple families, the contracts were being broken, these women had no way of out. If when they would run, they had no papers, they would be thrown in the Jordan jails system, locked away, and be just lost in the system. She began to fight for their rights. Here she is, wrongly done in her country, flees to another country, and now she is a domestic worker, but she is helping fight for other people to be free. To this date, she has seen 
almost 200 ladies set free, sent back to their home, reconnected their families, and living a new life again. When I heard about her and I said, I got to meet this lady, everybody was like, this is the sweetest, most awesome lady you would ever want to meet. I said, I got to meet her. And I fell in love with her. Just the joy of the Lord flowed out of her. Even through all the suffering that she's seen, no bitterness, no weakness, strength. Which brings me to this final point to write down is this. The goal of suffering is to make you stronger and sweeter. Oftentimes, suffering in our life, because we make the wrong choices, makes us weaker and bitter. But God says, in the end, you'll be strong, you'll be sure-footed, you'll rise on heights. And suffering in God's economy is to make you stronger and to make you sweeter. At all locations, we're going to receive communion a little bit, and we're going to respond. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go after Jesus and say, God, no matter what I face, I'm going to keep remembering what you've done for me. I'm going to keep rejoicing in you regardless because I, I, you want to grow stronger and want to grow sweeter. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you. Eyes closed, no one looking around. If you're here and you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's the moment, now's the time to receive him. Ask, God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. And for every one of us, we face suffering to some degree, to some measure. Father, I pray now, we give ourselves the process of healing. In Jesus' name, I pray, be it done. Be it done. And everybody said, amen.